blazing fires, raging adrenaline, and total anarchy, all within the walls of a federal prison. FBI tactical teams and negotiators work around the clock, trying to avoid a small-scale war and keep nearly 100 hostages alive. In the 1980s, the federal penitentiary in Atlanta housed some of the country's most notorious prisoners. 1,800 Cubans fleeing Castro's regime. 400 were hardened criminals. 200 were insane. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Castro called them undesirables. The U.S. government called them detainees. In 1987, they staged a bloody revolt. Now the FBI and special operations teams must infiltrate a burning prison to stop the violence before it rages out of control. Cuba, 1980. A plummeting economy and political unrest prompt Fidel Castro to allow Cuban citizens to leave the country. For the first time in history, the notorious dictator permits American boats to enter Cuba's Mariel Harbor. In a five-month period, over 120,000 undocumented refugees flee the country, heading for Florida. 2,700 are considered criminals or mentally ill under U.S. law. The Attorney General instructs the Bureau of Prisons to find space for them in America's already overcrowded prison system. 1,000 Cuban refugees are sent to the Federal Detention Center in Oakdale, Louisiana. Nearly 1,400 are transported to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. For seven years, the U.S. and Cuban governments negotiate to send the criminals and mentally ill refugees back to Cuba. On November 20, 1987, the State Department strikes a treaty with Cuba. Over 2,700 Cuban detainees will be sent back. Within 24 hours, Cuban detainees in both prisons get news of the decision. In Oakdale, Louisiana, a thousand of them riot, taking 28 prison guards hostage. But at the Atlanta Penitentiary, all is quiet. Warden Joe Petrovsky, but there was a trust between the detainees and the correctional officers, and that trust was basically the treatment that the detainees got from the correctional officers. Early Monday morning, three days after the treaty is signed, prison employee Ted Manier arrives at work. He notices an eerie silence. There were hardly any inmates in the breakfast area. And normally it would be uh, full of inmates who were making a lot of noise and talking, and there was hardly anybody in there, so it was really quiet, unusually quiet. On the first floor of the prison industries building, detainees make mattresses. On the surface, it looks like business as usual. But in an instant, detainees overpower their guards and ignite fires. On the third floor of the industry's building, Manir and his supervisor oversee a furniture-making shop. The riot spreads to the rest of the floors. It sounded like a roar, and it was coming up the stairwell. Uh, 
they got the door down. And they just came running in. And they had these hoods over their head. Like they were made out of gray t-shirts or gray sweatshirts. And they just had holes poked out for their eyes so they could see. Lanier tries to report the emergency, but he is attacked by one of the rioters. And I don't know if he was trying to hit me or just the telephone out of my hand. But he knocked the phone out of my hand that went across the room. Prison employees are facing their worst nightmare. Although they are well aware of the risks, they never thought it would happen to them. But we did realize there was a threat, but I guess you think you can control it. When you work with inmates, you get used to them, and sometimes you forget who they really are. The guards and factory workers are helpless. Unarmed and outnumbered, they face rioters carrying homemade weapons. The staff member notifies Warden Petrovsky of the crisis. Inside the wall, nobody carried weapons. The inmates always vastly outnumbered the staff. So if we had weapons in there, we could lose those weapons. The only weapons that we had was weapons in the tower. Petrovsky alerts the FBI and the prison's regional director. I try to give him an assessment of exactly what transpired and brought him up to date. As fire spreads throughout the industries building, the detainees force the guards and employees into a tool cage and lock the door. We kind of thought that unless there's some miracle, that we would probably just burn up because there's no way to get out of one of the cages. The riot spreads throughout the entire penitentiary complex. Enraged detainees capture guards, taking keys as they take hostages. They begin to release the regular prison population from their cells. The riot is beyond containment. The detainees now control most of the central buildings. Rioters attempt to gain access to the main cell block, but guards lock down the sally port just in time. As flames and smoke engulf the massive prison complex, nearly 100 guards and employees are trapped inside. Built at the turn of the century, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary is the largest penitentiary in the United States. It was a fortress inside that was surrounded by a wall. It raised from the ground approximately 40 feet, and the width on the top of the wall was approximately three uh, yards wide. So it was a massive, massive wall. The penitentiary is built on 300 acres of land with 28 acres of property inside the walls. Warden Petrovsky needs to figure out exactly where his people are located inside the complex. We had staff members in 11 towers that had very good observation over the entire outside compound who logged those employees that they recognized in those areas. We started a list of the officers that we thought were hostages. Ted Manier and his colleagues are trapped inside an equipment cage in the Burning Industries building. Several rioters try to convince the Cuban detainees guarding the cage to unlock the door. They were trying to uh, talk the guard into opening the door because they wanted to get us out and kill us or do whatever. So the guard had to tell them that they couldn't open the door and occasionally they would push one off for getting a little rassle. But the raging fire threatens to destroy the building. So the rioters are forced to move their hostages to another part of the prison complex. Oh, 
The only route takes them across the yard in clear view of the towers. A tower guard spots what he believes are detainees threatening prison employees. There was a guy that was up ahead of me and he got hit. I, I remember seeing him. He was a Cuban, he got hit right behind the ear. One of the hostage takers is killed and five others are wounded. I was getting worried because the bullets were going pretty close around where we were. Chaos reigns as guards and detainees run for cover. They ran us across to the corner of the building where they couldn't shoot at us. And that time they took us in the chapel. Detainees forced their hostages into a small room and locked them inside. Less than an hour after the riots begin, FBI agents from the Atlanta field office arrive at the penitentiary. The FBI has jurisdiction over criminal matters in all federal prisons. Warden Petrovsky briefs Weldon Kennedy, the special agent in charge. The first thing that I wanted to accomplish was to find out how many hostages had been taken, uh, how many might be injured, uh, what was the threat to those people who were, in fact, taken hostage? All of these people were like on an emotional high. I mean, they'd been prisoners for literally eight, ten years. Uh, some of them serving life sentences, and now they're free to roam around the prison. It was like a holiday. This is the area where they... Agent Leon Blakeney heads the Atlanta FBI SWAT team. <laughs> Agent Blakeney appears in silhouette to protect his identity. Nobody really knew what area that the, uh, that the inmates controlled. And they really didn't know how many hostages were taken. You had 2,500 people housed in that institution. Here's the administration. There were people running around uh, all over the place, and, and quite frankly, it was chaos. Chaos that had already turned deadly. As agents Kennedy and Blakeney develop their plan to retake the prison, they receive critical intelligence from two sources. From FBI agents posted outside the walls of the prison complex, and from prisoners inside the walls who don't want any part of the riot. We began to learn uh, who the hostages might be, where the detainees were holding up, uh, how many were there, uh, what kind of weapons they might have. The detainees have taken the guards' radios, compromising prison communications. Agents and guards switch to a secure frequency. Two white males and two black males. The situation is grim. Negotiations will be critical to resolving the standoff. Special Agent D. Rosario, an FBI negotiator, opens up a dialogue with the rioters. Unreasonable demands are being made. The hostage takers want things done now. And that's why it is so important to try to bring them down to a level where they can be reasonable. Can you negotiate with people at that very high emotional level? Generally speaking, no. So we had to give it time. The rioters are emotionally charged, angry over the shooting death of a detainee. This theme came up time and again. You killed one of ours. You had no reason to, and you killed him. And they wanted me to see the bodies, so I had the body brought out to where we were. I looked at the body. They wanted me to get emotionally involved with them. And these four that originally came out to talk to me really were only speaking for themselves. They were not speaking on behalf of the 1,400 that were in there. In the command post, Warden Petrovsky receives a frantic call from 16 employees who have barricaded themselves in cell block E. E block is home to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary's most dangerous criminals. 
these particular group of inmates were locked away and used to keep them from harming someone. If the detainees get into cell block E and free the inmates, the lives of all 16 employees will be in danger. The E cell block is also home to the prison system's most notorious inmate, Thomas Silverstein. A number of people in the Bureau of Prisons told me that he singularly was the toughest prisoner they believed that the Bureau of Prisons had ever housed or had in their custody. He was just an absolute uh, animal. And he hated everything to do with uh, the Bureau of Prisons or any of their staff. Silverstein was incarcerated in 1975 for a bank robbery. Years later, he was sentenced to multiple life terms for fatally stabbing an inmate and a prison guard. Thomas Silverstein was cold and he was a killer. He had two things on his mind to escape from jail because his crimes were such where he was going to die in jail. Uh, and, and the other objective was to kill people. Uh, it was as simple as that. The guards in cell block E are in grave danger. Special Agent Kennedy works with the FBI SWAT team to come up with a plan to rescue them. The SWAT analysis was that they believed that they could go over the wall out of view of the rioting detainees and retrieve those people out of that building successfully. The SWAT team will need ladders to get over the 40-foot high wall. Special Agent Blakeney calls on the Atlanta Fire Department and a National Guard helicopter crew to help carry out the plan. We put a helicopter up uh, on the opposite side of the prison to attract their attention and uh, at least have some diversion. Hey, Chief, here's the situation. We've got a hostage Seven hours after the riot began, the FBI SWAT team launches a daring mission to rescue 16 prison employees without endangering the lives of nearly 100 hostages. Seven hours after a riot breaks out at Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, an FBI SWAT team launches a mission to rescue 16 employees barricaded in one of the prison cell blocks. FBI Special Agent Weldon Kennedy knows that if the rescue attempt is seen by rioting Cuban detainees, it could spell disaster. They would not hesitate to kill hostages if it became apparent to them that we were going to try to retake the prison or retake any part of it. After scaling the wall, the FBI SWAT team approaches cell block E, home to the prison's most dangerous inmates. SWAT rushes the prison employees out of the building. Keep your head down. Identify yourself when you get down there. Across the prison yard, 27 employees, afraid for their safety, have barricaded themselves inside the prison hospital. Frustrated, they watch as their colleagues are escorted to safety. FBI SWAT team leader Leon Blakeney. You know, they're screaming, frantic, you know, come and get us, come and get us. The director of the Bureau of Prisons urges the FBI SWAT team to go back for the hospital employees. The SWAT personnel informed me that there was a 100% probability that they would be detected going over the wall to try to effect a rescue of the hospital people. We can't protect the other hostages that are being held in other parts of the prison. And my concern was if, if in fact, we were observed then uh, they would start killing the other employees. Blakeney wants to rescue the hospital staff, but knows it's a risk he cannot afford. The detainees break into cell block E and release the inmates. Vicious criminals run free including Thomas Silverstein, a ruthless killer.
As darkness falls, three buildings have been consumed by fire. Nearly 100 guards and employees have been taken hostage or have barricaded themselves inside the prison. Prison employee Ted Maneer is being held inside a room in the prison's chapel. So a man came up to the window, and he wasn't a Cuban. And the guy beside me said, that's Silverstein. And he came inside, and he had a flashlight, and he started shining his flashlight. He shined the light on me, he said, don't I know you? And I told him, no. He said, I don't, I've never seen you before. And he said, you don't know who I am? He looked worse than anything I've ever seen in any type of movie or anything. And when you look at him, you'd know he isn't a normal. <laughs> There's something, something strange about him. Uh, he's really scared. Detainees finally distract Silverstein and he leaves without harming the hostages. On day two of the standoff, FBI tactical commander Danny Colson arrives at the prison. You could hear this huge roar. It was like a million bumblebees. You could almost feel the energy of those rioting prisoners. Colson started the FBI's hostage rescue team, an elite counterterrorism group in 1982. The HRT is law enforcement's equivalent to the Navy SEALs of the Army's Delta Force. The only unit in the United States that has a sophisticated explosive or thermal breaching capability is the FBI's hostage rescue team. But the HRT is already tied up handling the riot at Oakdale. So I was going to a, a very difficult tactical assignment without the team I was used to commanding. Despite not having the hostage rescue team available to him, Colson must still develop a full-scale tactical rescue plan. He faces several obstacles. A prison is built to keep bad guys in. You have barred doors, you have steel gates. Well, these same type of things keep a rescue force from getting in. I needed help from the military, primarily from the Delta Force. Delta Force is the Army's special operations unit, but using them at the prison would be illegal. The Posse Comitatus law was passed right after the Civil War, and that law prevents the military from being involved actively with their personnel in civil law enforcement. Barring approval from the White House, the FBI must rely solely on civilian law enforcement. Weldon Kennedy assembles over 400 SWAT members at the prison. We had SWAT teams from all around the country, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, as well as, of course, the immediate uh, surrounding area. We figured that based on the capability we had, we were probably maybe an hour away from getting in to rescue the hostages. We were all concerned that, that, that they started killing hostages. We, we were helpless to get in there. And that's one of the reasons that, that D. Rosario and the other negotiators were working so hard to try to get somebody to talk to to calm the situation down. But the negotiations are not going well. None of the rioters D. Rosario has spoken with has enough power to influence the detainees. The negotiators need a different approach. We could be here for a very long time unless we come up with a group of people in there among the detainees that can speak basically for, if not all of them, for the majority. Rosario asks prison employees which detainees command the most respect. Files of these people were opened to us, and we looked at several of them, and we decided on five or six men. We went to the grading and called them by name. And they came to the grading. And we invited them to come over to our side 
and sit down at a table with us and talk with us. The detainees agree to talk with negotiators. And we began our first serious conversations in terms of how can we resolve this? What is it that you're looking for? The number one demand that they had was that ultimately the Immigration and Naturalization Service conduct individual hearings for each and every one of them to remain in the United States. It's a straightforward request. Osario agrees to pass it on to the Department of Justice. As the meeting ends, the negotiator uses a bit of psychology to help solidify the group's standing as leaders within the prison. We uh, decided to give these men the mail that had accumulated since before the riot began. In the penitentiary, daily mail is an important link to the outside world. They went back in there, and we could literally hear the shouting of glee uh, when these guys showed up with two bags full of mail. We believe it created in the minds of the others that these guys could get things done for them. And that's where it began. After that, we kept asking for the same men. Rosario is beginning to make progress, but negotiations go slowly. In the prison hospital, 27 trapped employees are out of time. Detainees are trying to break down the door of the hospital with a battering ram. The employees call Warden Petrovsky in the command center. Warden Petrovsky relays the information to Weldon Kennedy. Detainees could break through the hospital doors at any moment. We had 27 people in there, and there was concern that once the hospital was taken over, they might be injured or even killed. So the ram is going, we can hear it as a matter of fact, banging the metal doors of the prison. Bureau of Prison officials worry about what could happen if detainees get access to the drugs and narcotics stored in the hospital. Um, what about right here? Weldon Kennedy asks HRT Commander Danny Colson for a second assessment. I said, yeah, we can get him out. We can go over the wall. We can defend the area with the perimeter and slot him out over the walls, and we're out of there. Colson's biggest concern is that the detainees are watching news coverage of the riots. Inmates were watching TV to see what we were doing as much as they could and they could very well believe that a rescue of the entire prison was underway, and then they could start executing the hostages. Hospital workers are moments away from becoming hostages, or worse. So here we have a huge dilemma. Do we go in and take those people out of the hospital and save them, or do we let them be taken hostage? Kennedy decides a rescue is too risky. My decision was, based on all the information that I had, we will not go for the rescue. I will not authorize the rescue. And when he went back in and announced it to the Bureau of Prisons, I remember one Bureau of Prisons official storming past me and looking at me and said, if those are FBI agents, you'd go get them. And I said, no, he wouldn't. Weldon Kennedy wonders if he has just signed a death warrant for 27 innocent people. For two days, a riot rages at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Dozens of Cuban detainees now control the prison. 27 Bureau of Prison employees are trapped in the prison hospital. Weldon Kennedy, special agent in charge of the FBI's Atlanta field office, makes a tough decision. If we entered the penitentiary, if we tried to retake it, there was a threat they were going to immediately kill them all. Kennedy decides not to launch a rescue mission. Two hours after the decision, communication is lost with the employees in the prison hospital. 
It's the warden. Pick up if you hear me. I knew that if anything happened to any one of those 27 people, that I would forever live with that uh, as being the person responsible. Guards stationed at the prison towers gather intelligence as detainees move hostages across the prison yard. One guard calls the FBI command post with a disturbing development. A group of detainees is dragging acetylene tanks into a basement where they can access the prison's utility tunnels. Danny Colson is the FBI's tactical commander at the scene. They might be able to bring those tanks and get enough of them underneath our command post where the tunnels ran and uh, cause an explosion which would have decimated the command post and maybe have allowed them to escape. Colson and the FBI SWAT team prepare to go down into the tunnels. The tunnels were, were designed for two purposes. One is that all the utilities went through the tunnels, the steam pipes, the electrical pipes, and they were big tunnels. There were also ventilation tunnels that uh, started uh, big enough for a man to walk in standing up and ended up uh, only a few inches uh, uh, high. Colson and SWAT team leader Leon Blakeney have no idea what they will encounter once they are inside. Prison maps aren't reliable and communication with agents above ground is not possible. As the team makes their way through the underground maze of pipes, they encounter a group of detainees. Leon Blakeney. Once we got in the tunnels, we discovered then that, that in fact the Cubans were in there. And oftentimes we'd come in very close proximity to them, uh, within 10 feet. Of them. There would be a bunch of them, and we'd confront them. And fortunately, uh, every time they'd turn around and run. The SWAT team is unable to find the acetylene tanks in the vast underground system. But they are convinced the detainees are exploring the tunnels for a possible escape route. We decided that the tunnel system was, was a real threat to the successful uh, resolution of, of the crisis. Ultimately, we were able to, to station uh, SWAT teams down there, the Chicago SWAT team. I handle one part of the tunnel system, and the Washington Field Office SWAT team handle another uh, part of the tunnel system. On day three of the standoff, Danny Colson receives intelligence from agents with high-powered binoculars positioned around the prison. The detainees have moved nearly all the hostages to a building known as the American Dorm. Colson begins to formulate a tactical rescue plan. And what do you think they can mean? What, what can it... Outside the prison, Crowds gather. Families of the hostages, the prison guards, and even the detainees wait for information about their loved ones. The media covers breaking news from the penitentiary. There was hundreds of media people there. There were networks, there was local TV. They established a tent city right across the street from the, from the prison. A single reporter and a simple error threatened to bring the standoff to a violent end. Special Agent D. Rosario. The New York SWAT team was coming off shift, and the Chicago SWAT team was coming on shift, and they passed each other right at the steps of the administration building. And it looked impressive because there was two very large groups of armed men, all dressed in black. Local reporter in Atlanta watching this and sees these 40 or 50 men dressed in SWAT gear going up the front steps and jumps to the conclusion and says so on live TV that, well, there they go. Looks like the FBI is going to retake control of the prison. When the detainees see the media report, they take immediate action. They brought several hostages out to the yard. And for the benefit of, of our cameras so we could see them, they brought these hostages out and they poured gasoline over them. And then they took their cigarette lighters and began clicking whilst literally screaming at us, if you want to assault us, go ahead. As soon as you do, we're setting fire to these men. Without knowing it, a young journalist may have just made a mistake that could cost the lives of nearly a hundred innocent people. 
At the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI agents negotiate with Cuban detainees who have taken over the prison. The lives of nearly 100 hostages hang in the balance. On day three of the standoff, a journalist's error ignites a crisis. FBI tactical commander Danny Colson. All along our negotiators have been telling the, the Cubans that, that we weren't coming in and that we wanted to negotiate and wanted them to surrender. And now a reporter is saying we're coming in. The erroneous media report makes Special Agent D. Rosario's job even tougher as he negotiates for the lives of the hostages. We had brought them down to such a, a reasonable level of emotion, and when they thought that the FBI was about to assault, they literally lost it. We came literally within a few heartbeats of losing the hostages right then and there. We sent everybody to what we call phase line green, which is the last position you are in before you do a rescue. It was like a spark that was about to uh, ignite this terrible inferno of, of, uh, of energy we had built up there. I had to convince them that no such assault was going to take place and that you know, if, if things were going so well and so positive, why would we even think about assaulting them? After three tense hours, the rioters agree to continue negotiations and spare the hostages. We're just lucky that our negotiators were able to calm them down and we didn't have any loss of life. For Colson, the close call is a warning sign that the standoff could explode into a full-scale riot with very little provocation. At the end of day three, he obtains presidential approval to deploy Delta Force in a civilian crisis. The special operations team arrives in Atlanta disguised as FBI agents. There were three things that I desperately needed from them. The first was their breaching capability. They had all the breaching capability that would be necessary to get back into that prison to do a dynamic rescue. They had the ability to use explosives to blow steel doors down or blow locks out. They had the ability to use thermal devices to cut in an instant through steel and cable. The second thing I wanted was their sniper capability. When we went into that prison, if we had to go in, I wanted the very best snipers I could find doing cover for my men as they went in. The other thing is they have tremendous medical capability. They travel with a complete hospital. Uh, they set up with the doctors, nurses, uh, uh, emergency equipment, uh, the latest state-of-the-art everything. If Delta Force or FBI teams engage the detainees in combat, the military hospital is prepared to treat any injury. They can bring their doctors right in with us. They can pop a chest and do open-heart surgery right there in the premises if necessary. For the next several days, Delta Force snipers keep the detainees under constant surveillance. The rioters are working 24 hours a day, making weapons by the thousands. There's all kinds of steel inside the, uh, the prison, and they're very resourceful with the equipment, the ground weapons and the spears. Each one of them must have had at least two weapons. Delta Force sets up surveillance cameras all over the complex to track the movement of the detainees. Agents look for ways to get closer to the areas where the hostages are being held. If the Cuban detainees decide to kill the hostages, the tactical team must be able to launch an assault on a moment's notice. We've got two people guarding the American dorm. This is not something where you play a video game and after it's over, you hit your reset button and everybody's alive again. You're talking about the lives of human beings here, and you have a tremendous responsibility to try to get those people out. Colson and Blakeney go back into the tunnels underneath the prison. One of the tunnels leads to the prison's electrical room. It's located right outside the American dorm where most of the hostages are held. We were literally uh, on the other side of the window from inmates that were uh, right across right across the walkway from where the hostages were being held. 
by doing that, we moved our response time from half an hour to 10 seconds. It was a tremendous, a tremendous leap in our capability at that point. With the FBI SWAT teams and Delta Force in place, they will be in a better position to protect the hostages if negotiations break down. Until they start harming a hostage, there's no reason for us to try to gain forcible entry to save these people. We therefore will wait as long as it takes. The rioters have enough food to survive for up to a year. The day after Thanksgiving, they erect a Christmas tree on the roof of the building. That was very disheartening to us. Maybe they didn't intend it psychologically to be that way. We interpret it as we are going to be here through Christmas. On day eight of the crisis, prison guards stationed in the tunnel hear the sound of a drill. One guard recognizes the voice of Thomas Silverstein the most vicious inmate in the federal prison system. They think Silverstein is searching for a way out. We knew he would absolutely kill a hostage if it, if he, if it would help him escape. Weldon Kennedy asks Danny Colson to go back into the tunnels to apprehend Silverstein. So we walked down the tunnel, and, and we did a tactical formation going down the tunnel, and we had lights on our weapons. Suddenly we noticed there was water on the floor, and then the water started getting deeper, and it was over the tops of our shoes, then over our ankles, and up to our knees. Then what we finally realized is that that tunnel was actually flooded. The water flooding the tunnels had been dumped by National Guard helicopters to fight the fires. Looking further into the tunnel, he can see water fills it to the ceiling. He knows there is no way Thomas Silverstein can be in there. And what they were hearing was there were, there were tubes, ventilation tubes, that were above the water line. So the guards were actually hearing his voice, but we knew he wasn't going to get out. Still, Colson knows that Silverstein is as dangerous inside the prison as he is on the outside. He was a sociopath, and he'd already he'd proven he would commit murder. So had he done that, had he attempted to, to harm a guard or, or anybody else in there, uh, it would have caused us to have to go in and launch a rescue we didn't want to have to launch. And then again, we were faced with significant loss of life. Knowing Thomas Silverstein is such a dangerous wild card, FBI negotiator D. Rosario must convince the detainees to turn him over. United States, OK? I emphasized and kept re-emphasizing the fact that uh, Tommy Silverstein could become a very grave liability to the Cuban detainees and to their cause and to what they were trying to attain. I was told that uh, they would think about it. Rosario tells the rioters that until Silverstein is back behind bars, the hostages are in grave danger. As long as the vicious killer roams free, the standoff could come to a sudden and violent end. More than a week into the intense standoff with Cuban detainees at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI negotiators worry that a dangerous American prisoner could jeopardize a peaceful end to the conflict. What I suggested to them was that at some point or another, it would be in your best interest to turn Tommy Silverstein over to us. Special Agent D. Rosario tries to convince the rioters that Silverstein is a serious threat to prison employees who are being held hostage. The American inmate is jeopardizing their position in the negotiations. A short time later, a large group of detainees appears at the sally port gate of the main cell block. And there was about 100 Cubans screaming, waving their sabers in the air. And I could see they had Silverstein. And in the midst of all these screaming Cubans, they threw, literally threw Silverstein at us. 
detainees tell agents how they captured Silverstein. So they gained access to the pharmacy. They took some narcotic. They put it in a can of a fruit cocktail, which he was known to like, and fed him fruit cocktail laced liberally with this drug, which in effect knocked him out. The FBI viewed Silverstein's capture as an act of good faith. That told us a lot. They don't want to hurt the hostages. It showed the negotiators that these Cubans were responsible. They were willing to do things to cooperate with us in order to reach a common goal, which is a, a great step in any negotiation process. On December 1st, a separate riot at Louisiana's Oakdale Penitentiary is resolved. The Cuban detainees incarcerated at Oakdale agree to release their hostages if the INS will review their cases. The government of the United States, through the voice of the Attorney General, told them, you know, it's not unreasonable to give you a hearing. D. Rosario offers the Atlanta detainees the same deal. Hostage takers have gotten exactly what they want, but still, negotiations stall. Audio surveillance reveals the rioters think the FBI will not use deadly force to remove them from the prison, that they would have a fighting chance to overpower federal forces. The Cubans thought that the FBI and uh, the other assets would come in with nightsticks and batons and just duke it out. The next day, Colson decides to send the hostage takers an indelible message. The detainee agrees to talk with Colson. And he said, I need to go to the restroom. So I said, wait right here. So I went around the barrier and I got the uh, Marshall's SOG team and the New York City SWAT team. I, I got them all up and I said, put on all your gear and line up along the walls and look mean. And he walked around that barricade and when he walked down that corridor, he literally jumped off the ground. I said, this is not going to be a, a nightstick duel with your swords. We're going to use deadly force. The rioters agree to the terms of the surrender. On day 12 of the standoff, the Cuban detainees release their hostages. I will never, ever forget those guys coming through that sally port and walking right by me and, and the look of relief. They were haggard and they were tired and they were worn out with this great sense of relief and they were all smiling ear to ear. When we finally walked out with hostages, not one of them having been harmed in any way. We regarded that as a huge success. After 12 intense days, the Atlanta prison riot is over. One of the most important things that sort of focused the American public on the plight of the Cubans. And um, I think that was important. They did have a story to tell. They just told it in the wrong way. After the riots, all detainees are granted an INS hearing. Some are released. Others with criminal records or mental disabilities are repatriated back to Cuba. The rest remain in prison. In the 1990s, the disguised serial bank robber terrorizes the Chicago area. Expert with weapons, aware of police procedure, and fearless, he hits hard and disappears fast. Police and the FBI realize the only way to stop him is to catch him in the act. But his desperate violence proves impossible to predict.
The average bank robbery yields roughly $3,000. Yet some criminals risk everything for the take. In suburban Chicago, a disguised gunman began a series of robberies, growing more violent with each one. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Tracking the robber's movements, agents discovered he wasn't alone and would do anything to avoid capture. March 5th, 1990, Chicago, Illinois. $1,000? At a bank on the city's south side, employees began what they thought was a normal work day. The neighborhood was quiet until 10 a.m. Don't you touch that alarm. The disguised gunman threatened to kill anyone who didn't follow his orders. The tellers knew not to interfere. It was over in seconds. When they were safe, they called police. Yes, um, we just... The Chicago police patrol officers closest to the bank responded first. We walked up, got my face. The witnesses reported that the robber was a white male, about six feet tall. But they didn't see details of his features because of his disguise. He wore gloves and carried a police scanner. The man was aggressive, handling his semi-automatic handgun with confidence. He left no fingerprints, and security cameras revealed no other immediate clues. Police canvassed the area, hoping to find other witnesses. A woman who lived near the bank reported that she thought she had seen the robber. She said that at about the time of the robbery, she saw a man who seemed to be wearing a fake beard get into a small four-door sedan. She did not get the plates, but she did give officers a description of the car. Checking every similar car in the area, they soon found one they believed was the robber's getaway vehicle, abandoned a few blocks from the bank. The officer approached with caution in case someone was still inside. But it was empty, except for a paper towel covering the broken ignition. A records check revealed the car had been stolen from a mall parking lot four days earlier. Later processing produced no leads to the robber. Bank robbery is a federal offense, so police contacted the Chicago FBI. Hi, this is Keith. Supervisory senior resident agent Bill Keefe had handled dozens of bank robbery calls. At that time, we were extremely busy with bank robberies. We had had two on one day. We were running sometimes as many as three robberies a week. Most were committed by amateurs who went in without a plan and were caught quickly. But when the bank robbery squad reviewed the reports on the South Side robbery, they noted how clean the assault was, obviously well planned. They believed it was not the bearded assailant's first robbery and would not be his last. Two months later, the robber with the fake beard hit a bank in the suburb of Libertyville. Not satisfied with cash drawers this time, he ordered a teller to open the vault. Don't you try anything. 
Come on, let's go. He said his police scanner would let him know if anyone hit the silent alarm. Put it in there. Come on. The robber escaped with thousands of dollars in cash. But this time, a teller got the license plate number from his getaway car. While Libertyville police looked for the car, Chicago FBI agents interviewed the tellers. Special Agent Hank Schmidt learned the gunman was more aggressive this time. He controlled people with the weapon. Uh, he would intimidate them by putting the gun up towards their face. He pointed the gun directly at someone when he talked to them, uh, which was intimidating to the, the tellers and the customers. Although interviews yielded no clues, police did find the getaway car, abandoned a few blocks from the bank. Again, the vehicle had been stolen from a mall three days earlier. And as before, the thief used a towel to hide the broken ignition. FBI Special Agent Dave Childry was part of the robbery squad. The squad uncovered an earlier robbery in Wilmette, Illinois, believed to be committed by the same man. One surveillance camera photo provided a frightening clue. There was a very good picture of the robber taken in which he was using what we call a weaver stance. This is a shooting position taught to police officers. It was taught to FBI agents. And if you have been taught to shoot like that, you recognize it. This person might have had some law enforcement training. If so, he would know how these investigations work, and he could prove very difficult to catch. The local press dubbed him the Bearded Bandit. Investigators took advantage of the coverage to ask citizens for help. They published enhanced stills from the robberies, hoping someone would recognize him despite the disguise. We put his picture on the news. He did wear a beard, a fake beard, and mustache, uh, and a ball cap. So after running those pictures, we were not getting any tips from the public. In November 1990, the elusive bandit hit a bank in Wheeling, Illinois. A teller hit the alarm before he was told not to. All available units, please respond to a 1090 at the Wheeling Bank and Trust. Two Over his scanner, the gunman heard the police responding. He didn't leave the bank, which would be the normal reaction of bank robbers. They're there to rob the bank. They're not there to get involved in a shootout with the police. He stayed in the bank while the police were responding and held the gun up to the cashier and counted down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It seemed he knew how long he had before police responded. More evidence he might be a cop. As the robberies continued, it looked like the bandit purposely chose targets in different jurisdictions to complicate the investigation. No bank was ever hit the second time. The robberies would be on the other end of the suburban area against Lake Michigan, and then they would be out in Schaumburg or Elk Grove Village or up north in a lake county such as Libertyville. As he struck in new suburbs, the FBI had to coordinate with a growing number of police departments. Palatine, Illinois Police Chief John Kozel, a detective sergeant at the time, learned of the case and that the bandits' getaway cars belonged to shopping mall employees stolen at the beginning of their shifts. He would steal one of the employee cars knowing that it would not be reported stolen for approximately eight hours, so he knew he had eight hours to get the vehicle to where he needed to put it before anyone would even discover it missing and it would become hot on the system. 
When dumping the cars, the robber did his best to interfere with the ongoing investigation, wiping them clean of fingerprints and leaving no trace of himself behind. It was very apparent that he was aware of evidence gathering techniques, of police methods. In the end, agents found nothing of evidentiary value in any of the cars. Since the cars didn't help identify the bandit, investigators followed every conceivable lead that might. They visited theatrical shops around the city, hoping a salesperson might recognize the man with the fake beard as a customer. Again, nothing. The bearded bandit committed seven armed bank robberies in the Chicago area between January 1990 and February 1991. Then the robberies stopped. We went over what we had done to that point in time, looked for things we might have missed. Maybe he'd been incarcerated somewhere. Maybe he'd moved out of state. Maybe he was dead. We just didn't know. The bandit's trail stayed cold for nine months. On November 4th, 1991, Palatine police officer Kevin Maher was working the day shift. A dispatcher in training rode along to learn procedure. I was heading southbound on Quinton Road when I saw a vehicle heading northbound. And I looked in my side view mirror and I thought what I saw was an expired tag. So I made a U-turn and I was telling my ride along that we were gonna go up and see if this vehicle had expired plates. And if it did, I would conduct a traffic stop and show him how we conduct a traffic stop and how we punch all the numbers into the computer. It was supposed to be a routine stop. The person driving the vehicle swerved over to the side of the road and jammed on the brakes. He's got a gun. Maher's first instinct was to protect his passenger. The bearded bandit was back. In November 1991, a routine Chicago area traffic stop erupted in violence a when a man shot Palatine police officer Kevin Marker. I was in a state of shock because it was broad daylight, it was 11 o'clock, and it was a quiet residential street, and it was a basic ambush. And after he fired the first round, the first round came through the windshield and struck me in the shoulder, and glass from the windshield struck me in the left ear. The officer down call went out on the Illinois State Police Emergency Radio Network. From more than a dozen surrounding suburbs, police and emergency personnel rushed to the scene. Marr realized one of the shots that pierced his windshield was aimed dead center and might have hit him in the head had he not moved to protect his passenger and reversed the car. While paramedics treated Maher, officers questioned him. As a police officer, he was a perfect witness. Trained in recalling details, he gave them a description of the gunman, the car's license plates, the type of gun, 
and the direction in which the attacker escaped. We got a male white, uh, six foot, 200 pounds, beard, hat, last scene going south from the scene. So let's spread out, start looking for the car, which way you want to go that? Police fanned out to find the shooter. More than 100 officers joined the search. Three blocks from the location of the attack, police found the shooter's vehicle. It had been reported stolen from a mall parking lot five days earlier. Palatine Police Chief John Kozel realized the grave danger. When someone is willing to shoot at a police officer um, on a routine traffic stop, we all realize that he, he's willing to shoot at anyone. His determination to escape is much greater than his concern for the safety of anyone. That would be a law enforcement officer, a citizen on the street. Uh, when you're willing to shoot a policeman, you're willing to shoot anyone. Kozel helped coordinate the search for the deadly gunman. We immediately set up a perimeter with the assistance of the state, county, and local officers in the area. We had canines on the scene. Uh, we had a chopper in the air. Uh, we notified the schools in the area to stay locked down. Evidence technicians began to process the car. The ignition was broken, the damage covered by a paper towel. They looked for fingerprints that might help them identify the perpetrator, but found none. Canine handlers brought in their dogs, which are trained to remember a scent from a specified place, then follow only that scent, ignoring others. But the trail ended not far from the vehicle. Despite the massive effort, the suspect somehow slipped away. In addition to taking it personal when one of our officers is shot, uh, we all know that a citizen is much more likely to be injured or killed, and uh, we work that much harder to uh, bring him to justice. For more resources, they called in the FBI and Supervisory Special Agent Bill Keefe. I was asked to come over to the Palatine Police Department by the Chief of Police. There had been a composite sketch drawn, and everybody was reviewing the circumstances of the shooting. For nearly two years, Keefe and his squad had been working the Bearded Bandit case. I had asked uh, if we could look at the car that was found, and when I looked at the ignition, this was our bank robber. After being treated, Officer Maher came to the station to look at surveillance photos of the bearded bandit. He said the bank robber did look like the man who shot him. We surmised that he was on his way to do a bank robbery. He knew once the officer ran the plate, the car would come back stolen. He also knew that with the guns he had in his vehicle, it's not something he could conceal if the officer walked up to the vehicle. The bearded bandit had made a huge leap in violence. This guy wasn't going to go away. We were going to have to come up with a very innovative way to either identify him and charge him, or that we were going to have to catch him in the act. Chief Kozel brought the many investigators together. After the initial search, uh, uh, we set up a uh, 
multi-jurisdictional task force here at our police department. We had uh, the FBI, the uh, state police, Cook County Sheriff's Police, and all the local agencies uh, from our area and those involved in the Fear of Bank Robber series. Since their suspects seemed to know police procedure, they adjusted it. We learned we had a, a violent bank robber that was using a scanner. We were no longer giving out the location of the bank over the air. We were giving out a code number for each particular bank. In progress. Go ahead and give us code the task force hoped patrol officers in the area could use the codes to respond to robbery calls without the bandit realizing it. Especially you undercover agents. Confident that the bearded bandit would resume his crime spree eventually, police began doing spot checks of banks throughout the region. On November 18th, two weeks after the shooting, Elk Grove Village, Illinois police officers saw nothing suspicious at one bank on their list. But later that morning, a woman leaving a nearby business did. Two people in obvious disguises entering the bank. Two weeks after a police shooting in the Chicago area that was linked to the bearded bandit, the gunman reappeared in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, this time with an accomplice. 911, can I help you? While a witness outside the bank called police, there's something very strange going on here. The robbers struck. The bandit demanded money from the vault, his accomplice standing guard. 911 dispatch, aware of the bearded bandit, used a prearranged code to alert officers. 2130, 2132, code green. Without revealing information over the police scanner. They also alerted the FBI. Special Agent Hank Schmidt realized the new danger. The big concern is that the robber, in some cases, discharges the weapon when he's using it to gesture at the employees. So the potential for violence is always there. The numbers obviously increase if we have two people that are armed. In the bank, the manager explained they could not get into the time delay vault. The dispatcher instructed the witness outside to leave in case there was gunplay. With the money from the cash drawers, the robbers fled. Unaware the police had been called, the teller hit the alarm. Elk Grove Village officers approached with their sirens off, quietly surrounding the bank. If the robbers were still inside and heard police, they might take hostages. Officers were in even more danger, according to Palatine Chief John Kozel. For the first time, we had two bearded individuals rob a bank. That, of course, increased our sense of urgency even more. Now we had two armed gunmen to deal with uh, when law enforcement arrives at these banks. 2600, can you uh, call the bank, uh, find out? If they Through the dispatcher, the police talked with bank employees. The manager said the robbers had left. The officers had to be sure. The robbers could be holding a gun on the manager, forcing her to lie. The dispatcher asked them to send one employee outside to talk to police. The manager gave them the description of the woman chosen to go. Twenty-six hundred. Have the official come out. Okay, I see you're coming out. Hi, are you aware there was a bank alarm here? Yes. Is there anybody hurt inside? No. The employee assured them the assailants were gone and no one was injured inside. All right, guys, the bank is clear. Go on inside. The officers moved in to clear the bank for certain. One of the witnesses uh, told us that. She believed that the second person, a smaller person, uh, was possibly a woman disguised as a man.
After the Elk Grove Village robbery, police recovered two cars with the bandit's signature ignition covering. It was more evidence of his criminal sophistication. To cleanse himself after leaving the bank, he would drop the one off a, a block from the bank uh, that he had just gotten into that all the witnesses had seen him uh, leave the bank in, and he would uh, go a few blocks away and get into the other vehicle that he had left there previous, and then since cleanse himself from that first hot vehicle. All of the cars were similar, according to Special Agent Dave Childry. We were able to kind of key on the cars by the type, the make, the size, the non-visibility of them. They were just everyday cars. He was stealing them, then letting them sit for several days before using them as getaway cars. The task force asked to be notified of similar cars stolen from area shopping malls. We were successful in getting information on cars of that type that were stolen in the northwest suburbs and in the city of Chicago. We would put that information out on a weekly basis. Agent Scott Backen from the FBI and Sergeant Steve Peterson from Chicago PD actually went to every roll call of approximately 50 to 60 law enforcement agencies and spoke to the individual officers on the need to find these cars. Those personal visits mean a lot more than just putting something out on a teletype. Somewhere in the metro area, they hoped to find a getaway car after the bandit stole it, but before he used it in a robbery. Weeks later, Officer Tom Polinski was checking an apartment building parking lot in Niles, Illinois, when he spotted a stolen car on their list. It did look like the bearded bandits' work. The agreement was if they found one of those and it did turn out to be stolen when they ran the uh, license plate, that they would back off and notify us. Uh, that happened. Uh, we set up a surveillance on that vehicle. FBI agents and Niles police officers and detectives watched from an empty apartment overlooking the stolen car 24 hours a day. On December 13th, we found out that the Rolling Meadows police had located another stolen car that was in all probability one of the bearded bandits' cars. Chief Kozel was sure they were right. These two particular vehicles were both stolen out of uh, large mall areas. Both were owned by employees of those malls. Um, the MO was perfect. They set up surveillance on the second car in Rolling Meadows, too. Rolling Meadows PD stepped up. They shared uh, time, detectives, intelligence, sat with our agents out there 24 hours a day. To further ensure the bandit did not slip away, the FBI wanted to install tracking devices in the vehicles. But they couldn't do so in the parking lots. Late one night, agents removed the two cars. and replaced them with lookalikes for a few hours. It was a risky move. The thief could return at any time and spot the agents or the decoy cars. At the FBI garage, technicians installed the remote tracking devices in each vehicle. They also equipped the cars with remote kill switches that would allow agents to shut down the engines from a distance. They put the cars back and waited. Days passed. There was a nagging doubt in, in all of our minds that maybe we had been discovered, that perhaps he had seen one of us or a police officer going in and out of this apartment they were using to watch the car in Niles that he had seen somebody near the car in Rolling Meadows. 
and that he was just going to back off these cars and never come back. We weren't sure. We just didn't know, but we, we were committed to watching these cars until something told us otherwise. After a week, the vigil paid off. A van pulled up, and a man approached one of the cars. This was, in my mind, a do or die effort. This is, this is going to be our only shot. If we miss this, he's going to know we're onto him. They hoped they could peacefully end the bandit's crime spree. But no one had forgotten the last time the gunman was cornered. In 1991, as Chicago area investigators watched two stolen cars they believed were going to be used in the bearded bandit's next holdup, a man entered one of the cars. Special Agent Hank Schmidt believed it was their suspect. Uh, he matched the general physical description of the, uh, the person we were looking for as the uh, bearded robber. We have a man, we have a man. The man had been dropped off at the vehicle by someone driving a van. Mini room, mini wagon, in a white van. Heading southbound down the alley. When he drove away, the van followed. Investigators could not identify either driver. They had to be careful. If the bearded bandit and his accomplice spotted a tail, they might start shooting. But FBI technicians had installed a tracking device in the car, allowing agents to follow at a distance. The suspect parked the stolen car near a suburban bank. Mini wagon is parked here. The man is behind him. Hearing the news, Supervisory Special Agent Bill Keith believed they finally found their target. When that vehicle showed up in the vicinity of a bank, our adrenaline really was pumped up, and we really knew that we were going to have it. This car was likely the first getaway car for the next day's robbery. Agents believe the two suspects would next pick up the second stolen car in Rolling Meadows. Standing down. They were right. That vehicle was also equipped with a tracking device. Surveillance agents followed that car, believed to be a secondary getaway car, to a hardware store about 20 miles from the bank where the pair left it. both suspects in the van, agents no longer had the benefit of a tracking device and had to stay close. They followed the van into Hanover Park, Illinois, and watched as it pulled up to a townhouse. Now, Special Agent Dave Childry could identify the people inside. We had a license plate and two vague descriptions of people, a man and a woman. Normal record checks on that license plate would tell us that that van belonged to Jeffrey and Jill Erickson. The FBI and police worked through the night to learn more. We had done uh, a lot of research, calling police departments, trying to see who these people were. We were looking for a, a previous arrest record. Uh, which we didn't find. During this process, we had received some information that Jeffrey Erickson had been a police officer. In 1986, Jeffrey Erickson worked as a patrol officer in a Chicago suburb. 
He distinguished himself as a skilled marksman. But he was uninterested in the everyday requirements of the job. Traffic stops, paperwork. He was about to be fired when he resigned. Records also showed that Jeffrey Erickson opened a used bookstore in early 1991, during the time the bearded bandit was on hiatus. It appeared he and his wife, Jill, a university chemistry student, led a double life, using bank robbery money to build a middle-class existence. He might not have seemed threatening on the surface, but Special Agent Schmidt knew he was. Because he's a trained individual, he knows how we're going to react. He can plan ahead for that, and uh, if he's trained with a weapon, he's going to be more professional in the way he handles that weapon, and he's going to uh, be a, a bigger threat to us. Investigators considered waiting until the Ericsons approached a bank the next day, but decided not to risk a shootout near employees and customers. We had enough that we did not have to get him in the vicinity of a bank. The safest approach would be when he came to the car, the stolen car, we would arrest him. While surveillance units watched the suspect's home, a SWAT team set up near the car in the hardware store parking lot. Police Chief John Kozel the SWAT team set up on the, uh, the vehicles were very well aware of his background and uh, knew that he may shoot first, and they were taking that into account. By the morning, they were ready for the Ericsons to make their move. About mid-morning, the surveillance uh, units advised us that the van was, in fact, moving from the residence with uh, at least two people. They were heading in the direction of where we were watching the, uh, the stolen car. The surveillance team advised us that Mr. Erickson had got out of the vehicle in an adjoining parking lot. Okay, yeah, the driver's in the van still. He's, he's walking uh, west. The FBI had installed a kill switch in the stolen car, which they could use to turn off the engine from a distance. Uh, we watched him uh, come around the corner from that other parking lot, go to the vehicle, and enter the vehicle and start that vehicle. Erickson was distracted by the car trouble. Okay, let's go in. The SWAT team moved in. Back out of the car! Out of the car! Put your hands where I can see Get back out of that bag! Out of the car, put your hands where I can see them. I know him. that the pressure uh, of to shoot car. or not shoot out is a split-second decision. Get, the bag. get your hands, hands up. back in there get out of the car. And most law enforcement officers don't want to have to shoot an individual if they don't have to. No one wants to take a life that way. Uh, we felt like we controlled him. Out of the car! Slowly! After twice reaching for his bag, Erickson finally followed orders. On the ground. If he'd come out of the bag with a gun, it would have been an entirely different situation. I asked him as we were transporting him after the arrest to the federal lockup, you being a former police officer, you would know that a gesture like that could get you shot. And he looked at me and he said, well, I figured you'd shoot me in the head and it would be over with quickly. In the car, agents searched Erickson's bag and found the bearded bandit's tools, loaded guns, a police scanner, gloves, a beard and a wig. His bank robbery kit in that bag, it was very helpful to the case. Uh, without that information or that evidence, we just arrested a car thief. 
Having Jeffrey Erickson safely in custody was only half the job. In the adjoining parking lot, the SWAT team approached the van. It might be Jill Erickson inside. Agents scrambled to follow. The chase barreled through 11 suburban jurisdictions, reaching speeds of 110 miles per hour. A roadblock didn't work. And she had fired multiple rounds uh, out of that van, uh, either at the pursuing agents or other people in traffic. Uh, it was a big concern for the agents that she might hit an innocent civilian. Agents shot out the rear tires of the van. But the driver was not giving up. In 1991, a suspected bank robber led police and FBI agents on a dangerous chase through the Chicago suburbs. The fleeing van turned into an area that investigators knew had no outlet. They blocked the road. As the van charged them, they had to fire. They saw movement inside. Then, an FBI agent cautiously approached. The driver was wounded, a single self-inflicted gunshot. It was Jill Erickson. Later that night, in the hospital, she died. Special Agent Hank Schmidt. We believed it may have been a, a pact that they had both come up with that they would not be arrested. Uh, she that day carried out her part of the pack, and that day he decided, uh, for whatever reason, he didn't. Inside the van were spent cartridge casings, blood, fibers, other ammunition, uh, other weapons. There was a rifle with several hundred rounds of ammunition. That whole neighborhood became an, an evidentiary nightmare. There were bullets uh, that Jill had fired, uh, stuck in the side of houses, in cars, on the street. The FBI obtained a federal search warrant for the Erickson's home. We found some loose cash, but what impressed me was the amount of firepower in the house. An arrest at that home would have, would have evolved into a shootout. In that home, there was a weapon everywhere that you would find a picture or a statue or a knickknack in any other home. Among the weapons found was the 223 caliber semi-automatic assault rifle used in the attack on Officer Kevin Maher. Chief John Kozel realized a shootout would have been deadly to both sides. The weapons in his home were as good as any law enforcement has as far as firepower goes. Most of the long guns he had, those, that type of ammunition would zip right through an officer's bulletproof vest. 
Another discovery in the house spoke to the couple's mindset. One of the things that we found quite uh, ironic was the television was on and the VCR was on, and there was a Bonnie and Clyde tape in the VCR, and it was queued up to the uh, point where the uh, Bonnie and Clyde are being shot to death in the movie, and it was obvious that that was something they watched before they went out and did their bank robberies. The one robber was dead and one in custody. The violence was not yet over. Jeffrey Erickson's trial began on July 13, 1992. The evidence compiled against him was strong. In all conversations with the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, the trial was going very well. They were very uh, uh, upbeat about it, and the uh, evidence was, uh, in their mind, uh, going to be enough to convict him. But then, after court adjourned on July 20th, 1992, two deputy U.S. Marshals loaded Erickson and several jail inmates onto an elevator. Erickson was still dressed for court. The prisoners were headed for a van that would take them to the Metropolitan Correctional Center. By the time the elevator reached the parking garage, Erickson had somehow escaped his cuffs. Erickson shot U.S. Marshal Bill Frakes in the back and head, killing him. Ambushed, Frakes had not had time to draw his weapon. As the gunman ran for the street, court security officer and former Chicago police detective Harry Belwomany confronted him. Erickson shot the police veteran in the chest. But before Belwomany died, he got off four rounds, fatally wounding Erickson. The gunman was 40 feet from the crowded streets when he died. The thing is, all these resources were brought to bear on an individual. He was captured and was being tried in court. You, you think the case is over, but unfortunately, the only person that could stop this individual turned out to be a very brave, courageous policeman named Harry Bellomini, who, while dying, shot and killed Jeff Erickson. A newlywed, Bill Frakes was a promising young lawman just nine months into his career. Harry Bellwoman, he was a 31-year veteran. Two of his children are also Chicago police officers, carrying on his legacy. <laughs>